Good morning. We're going to ask all of you to start taking your seat, please. Welcome. 
Good morning, everyone. If I can have all of you take your seat, please. We're going to be getting started in maybe about a minute or so. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so excited to welcome you. Uh, I am Amanda Brown Stevens, Managing Director of Resilient by Design. Uh, we're so thrilled to be here. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about November 15th, uh, so it's hard to believe that now it's happening. Uh, so I just wanted to take uh, a few moments. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hold just a minute. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to talk a little bit about where we are in the process, what the next steps are. Um, so first, I want to uh, mention a few key people who are in the audience. So uh, our, um, we have some Resilient by Design executive board members here. If you're on the executive board, can you wave? <laughs> um, these are the people that really have been working hard over the last few years uh, to put this together. So um, we're really excited to have them. We also have uh, some of our Resilient by Design jurors here. Uh, if you guys want to wave. Uh, and uh, these are the jurors that uh, reviewed your initial proposals and will be reviewing your final designs. So be nice to them, but they don't take bribes. Uh, and then we also have here our, uh, a number of our Resilient by Design research advisors. If you guys could wave. Thanks so much for being here today. So. <laughs> Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about what's going to happen after today. So uh, we're very excited to see your uh, presentations today, to take a look at the boards. We'll have, as you know, an open house from 5 to 8 this evening uh, where you'll, uh, as design teams, get a chance to uh, spend time at your boards interacting with the public. Um, we've had, as, many, um, as with many of our events, we've had a huge amount of interest we have 450 people RSVP'd to our open house tonight. Um, so it just, I think, is a testament to the interest and excitement that people have about this project and about seeing your designs. So looking forward to that. Then starting tomorrow, we'll have uh, your designs online for public review and comment. So that's at uh, neighborland.com slash resilient bay. Uh, and so <clears throat> that'll be the opportunity for community members, for elected officials, for city officials, for other stakeholders to take a look at these initial ideas and to start to give feedback about what they find particularly exciting, inspiring, and what are some questions and concerns. So that information will be really helpful as the Research Advisory Committee reviews your design opportunities and goes through the matching process. So over the next three weeks, along with the public comment, which goes through December 1st, the Research Advisory Committee will be uh, reviewing your design opportunities. They'll be watching your presentations today. They'll be reviewing what's online um, using the criteria that we shared earlier. They'll review each individual design opportunity, and then they'll look at the cohort. They'll look at what are the most exciting uh, opportunities that rise up to the top, and then also 
what is the right mix of opportunities to make the biggest regional impact, <clears throat> making sure there's uh, opportunities around the region, different scope and scale, different focuses. So that process will be happening over the next few weeks, culminating on uh, a work session on December 8th, where the Research Advisory Committee will make those, um, will kind of conclude the matching process. And I just wanted to, to note both for our research advisors and teams, we've talked about this a little bit, but there will be the opportunity for research advisors to match teams with the design opportunity they present, but ask them to work on that, that idea, but in a different location than the one they proposed based on similarities of you know, what might make sense for that idea. So just a reminder to, to teams and research advisors that there is some opportunity for, uh, and also for cities and uh, other, other members of the public, there is some opportunity for some of the locations to be modified. So um, the only other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, the presentations today, as you know, you have 20 minutes to present. Derek here will be doing the timekeeping, and uh, we will, at this point, I know at the, at the midterm crit, we were a little bit flexible on time, and as I've mentioned, in this case, we're not gonna be flexible on time. We are gonna need to cut off at 20 minutes, so please, when Derek tells you your time's up, that really means your time's up. Uh, okay, without further ado, I wanna introduce our first team, Common Ground. Okay, start the clicker, ticker. Um, we are Common Ground, and uh, our team is focused on several things at, at the same moment. Uh, sea level rise has brought worldwide attention to uh, resilient uh, coastlines, resilient communities, and it's interesting, and this is a good thing, that's why we're all here. But at the same time, in California, here in the Bay Area, uh, uh, seismic activity is probably going to reach a, uh, a critical moment even before uh, we reach critical threshold with uh, the flooding by water. So, uh, what we're trying to do is work at the at the trying to reconcile very incremental dynamic with one that's very instantaneous. We need to think about frameworks, but we also need to think working from the bottom up within communities. So that's the common ground that we're talking about here. And we have uh, let me just mention my team members. Uh, uh, TL, TLS Landscape Architecture, Exploratorium, Guy Nordenson Associates, Michael Maltzen Architecture, Site Lab, Lotus Water, Rana Creek Design, Dr. John Oliver, and Rich Hindle. Um, and we're, we have really four areas of work. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is the geologic foundation of our work. And the second one is the commons of San Pablo Bay. And the third is life on water and the land. And the fourth is voices of San Pablo Bay. So the basic fact here in California is that we are, our, all of our topography is regulated by, uh, by earthquake faults. And these these, these uh, faults throw up big scarp ridges. So this creates a corrugated topography all the way across the lake of California, especially San Francisco Bay. The bay's got to move across that, move through it in different ways. And uh, these two faults, the Hayward and the, and the San Andreas, really confine the South Bay and the Central Bay. It's a big, soft kind of trough where most of our development is, is uh, located. And that's gonna be an issue for the, the future. But San Pablo Bay, where the bay begins to take a kind of a, of a eastward turn is a little different. These ridges really begin to plunge into the water and there are many different headlands uh, that, that, are, that are right at the edge of the water. It's no longer just, just soft ground. So we think this is a very interesting place to investigate and, and, and develop as an idea overall. Infrastructure around uh, San Pablo Bay currently is very brittle. Uh, as you can see, all these pictures is either flooding or it's about to break. And that's a problem because it's not going to last o over time. We think instead, what if we allow the land and the water to do a bit more of what they really like to do? 
What if we turn this encircling infrastructure to something perpendicular that allowed the water to flow in and, and the headlands to be used as part of our, our, our overall regional structure? So here, this, this is the idea of letting the land and the water uh, interact, become a framework for, for living, not necessarily all of it for development. San Pablo Bay is, is one part of the bay that really is missing an identity. But we think it could have one. It's, it's a working estuary. It's a, it's a very healthy estuary. It's full of uh, not only uh, all kinds of mixing. This estuary is tidal waters and brackish uh, fresh water mixing constantly. It's very fertile and, and, and fresh. It's got 80% of the bay's marshes. Uh, it's got uh, extremely rich wildlife resources that live within this, this matrix. So we would propose this. This is the commons. This is the place that where these, these cities, all the way around, have a front door that they can face on the bay and they can communicate with each other. They can be unified in certain ways with each other. And we can use, take the advantage of these headlands to actually uh, uh, access by water, opening up the mobility of places that are currently uh, hard, to access, hard to get around. And these, uh, these, these locations that we're talking about, these nodes, I'm trying to go back, yeah. We're not, all, we're not identifying these as huge ferry terminals and development sites. We're talking about a network of, of education and, and linkage between people. And so that would involve, first of all, a network of actual uh, field stations and outposts for understanding and research uh, that well, Susan will explain a bit more about. So a field station is really a research station in the field, in the landscape in which is being studied. Uh, we've been exploring this a lot. Um, scientists do this all the time, but we've been explore, exploring it as an educational opportunity. At the Exploratorium, we do a lot of work in outside landscapes, and the idea of situating people much better to understand the actual conditions they live in is the idea of having these learning hubs throughout this Bay Area, uh, San Pablo Bay community. At Sears Point, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the situations there. It's, it's situated on a headland with the southernmost point of, uh, of the, um, excuse me, uh, Rogers Creek Fault. It plunges under the bay and connects to the Hayward Fault. The earliest history of this of Sears Point is really not hard to see when you look at the landscape. It's um, it's mostly wetland on this on these headlands. Upland is a lot of farms that uh, have been in use for centuries. Uh, down down near the bottom, beer near the bay, it's a slough uh, and very open area that um, in the past uh, farmers would uh, send their goods down the sloughs. They would go out uh, San Pablo Bay and all the way to San Francisco and really all the way to the world. The goods and, and things that were grown up there, we always think of it as wineries, but in fact, um, in the past there were potatoes, grains, pumpkins, uh, hay, all kinds of things that uh, were, tr were traveling down these sloughs and going off to market. Um, eventually, of course, these sloughs were filled in a bit with, uh, with more agricultural areas. Um, it's easier to farm on flat land than on hills, so of course in the late 19th century it was important to develop these areas for them. You can see in this old map that these sloughs were really quite open, and up in that very tiny center one was a little area called Fairville, and it had a small landing, and many of these sloughs had landings, and many of the farmers and, and the people who were, they were getting and receiving goods using the waterways um, with uh, sort of small draft boats that uh, could work with the tides. Today, of course, um, it's quite different. Um, Pier 30, uh, Highway 37 ha is built on a levee. It has made it so that many of these sloughs are closed or culvertized. Uh, as you can see, sea level rise is already affecting Highway 37, uh, king tide, storm surges, all these things are making it inoperable at times. Uh, although there is a plan in um, 2088 to 
rebuild this uh, this particular landscape, uh, you know, rebuild the highway. Um, it's it's going to take another, uh, you know, several 20, 30 years to 2100 to finally finish it. And unfortunately, it's very expensive, and it probably won't really work. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of public money, $1.5 billion or more to, to invest in this, and perhaps there's other ways to use that money. We took a transect through Sierra's Point, really looking at some of the possibilities, and we use this as a, a research tool to understand what some of the options are. And I think the thing we really want to do, it's very simple, we just want to connect those uplands to the, south, to, the bay, to the baylands by opening up the waterways, perhaps using them um, for transportation systems. We also think it's a great opportunity. There's so much restoration going on with the Sonoma Land Trust. Uh, recently, the Bay Trail uh, created a, a wonderful section down there. So there's more access for people, but we want to improve that even more. And perhaps, uh, I mean, maybe we shouldn't really redo um, Highway 37. Maybe we should get rid of it. Maybe it should be uh, elevated so that the landscape works underneath it. Um, perhaps we can restore those waterways and think of light travel through those lands that won't affect the restoration that's going on because the boats don't really have the kind of heavy um, wave action that a ferry has. And also in this landscape, we really want to make it better for people to connect them so that they understand these processes are going to take years and years and years. So to create these small field stations that would be um, using vernacular architecture, pumping stations, old barns, whatever it might be, outfitting them with perhaps some exhibits, some information. They could also be used as um, community gathering points. And there would be a hub. There would be some in the wetlands, there would be some in the uplands, and there would be all around our Bay Commons as we're thinking about it. So our, our idea here is really not a lot of development. It's really just opening up this landscape to do what it used to do, to, to open up the waterways and to really think not only to use it to move in and out, but to mu use it to move across the bay. Wouldn't it be nice if people from Richmond could easily get on a small ferry and come to uh, Sears Point, and likewise in other directions? So I think our idea is really to make this bay a commons that everyone can share. Okay, and um, as Susan mentioned, um, life on the water and land is really important to us. Um, and water transit is, in our mind, key to resiliency. Historically, as Susan mentioned, um, early settlement used natural sloughs as a way to navigate across the bay. This is going to be difficult. <laughs> Coordination. Um, and then industrialization um, had re reclaimed along that waters through railroads. And then, but even through industrialization, actually, um, there was still ferries in service, water transit in service. It was only until the bridges were constructed that the ferries went away. Today, we're looking at a, a extended auto commutes, um, water redevelopment along the water. And so the question for us is, if we're going to grow the bay, um, can we increase and grow water transit to parallel that? So Vallejo is an interesting site for that. It's, to quote its model, the city of opportunity. It's in fact, um, provides a lot of opportunity for housing affordability in the region. It's where uh, myself, my family, and many others can actually buy a house in the Bay Area and live and work in here. That's tremendously important. And it also has, it's one of the most diverse cities in the nation, uh, which is um, very important. But that diversity has yet to take advantage of the economic opportunities that have surrounded the rest of the Bay Area, despite being only 30 miles uh, to San Francisco. It has an underutilized waterfront, even though it's a waterfront city. Historically, um, the Navy shipyard um, provided the economic opportunity for Vallejo for a long time, and its closure um, and subsequent bankruptcy of the city has um, not allowed Vallejo to kind of take advantage of the economic opportunities the rest of San Francisco has. It's actually a 
strategic location for uh, a resilient city. It does not flood. It, it relies on the marshlands to the north, the Napa River, to provide a natural resiliency for flooding. It also has headlands on Mare Island and, Nave, and the uh, Vallejo to provide that um, resiliency for seismic events. And it has a, an amazing marshlands that faces San Pablo Bay that is actually in growing sediment. Okay, so we think Vallejo is a, a fantastic opportunity to provide uh, a strategic location for investment in resiliency planning um, and infrastructure that can provide a catalyst for redevelopment of the city. So this idea that resilience planning and investment in resilient infrastructure here in the way of ferry transportation can provide the, the key catalyst for growth of a city. In fact, the, the, um, the idea of using a, a fleet of boats that are uh, not one size fits all, but the idea that we can invent patents and particularly invent boat infrastructure that fits the natural conditions of sediment deposition so we're not relying on heavy dredging. Scenario planning for Weta, which was created um, basically after the 1989 uh, Loma Prieta earthquake, um, provides that scenario for uh, emergency transportation when bay traffic is, is gone. And we think that, um, and there's actually planning that evacuates the entire San Francisco to city of Vallejo during emergency events. And the idea that this catalyst of resilience and scenario planning for emergency events can actually begin to grow a new identity and economic opportunities for a city like Vallejo. Here's a sketch that uh, Michael Malson had done that shows the idea of a, a, a new invested gateway and a, a hub for resiliency planning. Yeah, the other thing that what the WET is interested in doing that is, is, is intriguing is they're looking for ways to promote ferries. They're, they're got to have a bond issue coming, and they would really like to attach more uh, a variety of lifestyles, diverse uses, and things, different themes, so that ferries become a kind of a node in the city. It's really a place to collect and uh, organize people, organize your life around the water. We think it's a fantastic thing to get behind. Um, voices. Who are the people that have been living here? Who are the people that live here now, and how do they live? What is their social fabric? Um, what have they left, and what are they, what are they hoping for in the future? How do, how do their lives work? That's what we've got to understand in order to really motivate the process. In North Richmond, uh, we spent time working there, so we know people. We've met them on the ground. Uh, we know Whitney Dotson, who did um, Parkchester Marsh Restoration. We know uh, uh, Doria Robertson, who's doing urban, urban farming. And we know Tudi Mar, and all these people have, have control not control, they, they are the kind of the organizers, the advocates for this process. So what we'd like to do is help people that are stuck behind levees, behind railroads, isolated by infrastructure, and start a new process of realizing a park that really begins, let me give you the pan of the whole city here. It begins the uplands and the hills down to this very industrial waterfront. So. Many areas are going to be flooded, Mary uh, will also be liquefied. We want to find ways to overcome the super challenge of the infrastructure. This site is more challenged than any other one because of what's there, the refinery, the highways. And it's soft ground, and how are we going to help people live their lives in a way that's diverse and uh, ambitious for the future? So our idea is to begin uh, North Shore State Park and begin right there at Whitney's uh, 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 marsh restoration and work all the way to Point Richmond, all the way across the North Shore. And it's going to be a long undertaking. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of negotiations. But we need to start and we need to implement a number of different kinds of projects here between farming, access, ex uh, affordable housing that can get across infrastructure, beginning to work with the water, adapt to the water, so that this vision someday could be realized. And what this is about. This, this final, final vision to North Shore State Park is this is the promise. This is, this is where we could go with the fact of sea level rising. So it's not all bad necessarily. This is an opportunity to, to re reclaim and regain the thing that we had uh, from uh, 150 years ago, renewed again, but in, in connection with people's lives and access along the shore, connection uh, back and forth from water to land to the hills instead of uh, cutting off at the, uh, at the edges. And that's a big rock on San Pablo Bay. Thank you.
Thanks so much. So we'll just take a couple minutes to get uh, set up for the next one. I just want to make a couple comments um, for presenters. If you can uh, introduce yourself when you start speaking. Um, we do have a number of people watching uh, via our live stream. So just to make it clear who's speaking, especially we have some reporters uh, who are interested in that as well. I also wanted to ask uh, for the audience if you can um, please not le uh, enter or leave the room during a presentation. You know, the presentations are only 20 minutes long so, and it is a little bit distracting for people. So um, if you can, if at all possible, uh, stay in the room and wait um, uh, to come in and out um, for the presentations. If there, it looks like there are some seats in here. If people who are sitting on the floor would like to uh, come sit in some of the seats, uh, there's some seats up front and probably we could consolidate a little bit as well.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. It's now time for our next presentation from the Bionic team. Great, and thank you. Because there's more of you out there than those in the room, I'm going to recap uh, who we are. So the Bionic team gathered from all across the country in response to the RBD RFP. And we're a combination of uh, firms and organizations that were dedicated to finding a way to pilot solutions today and to figure out how resilient by design can be part of the thinking for really the next generation. So we stepped into this collaboration as planners, architects, landscape, I mean, you're all looking at the list up there, right? Landscape architects, economists, a developer, uh, an arts consultant, artists. And we realized, though, that this is not just a collaboration of our team, but really it's a collaboration with all of you. And what we're hoping for is a collaboration with a community that we'll be able to talk to and learn from in the future. Our collective has this variety of experience, and really today we're talking to you as a tripod, a three-legged stool. Marcel Wilson from Bionic, our local landscape architect anchor. Karen McCloskey, our academic pen anchor, and myself, Claire Wise of WXY. Okay, and that means this. So we want to emphasize as we zoom in that we know this challenge requires holistic thinking. It's not just about what we find and think right here on this spot or any spot in the Bay Area. Everyone is interconnected. It's a completely interconnected problem, which relies, will rely on better and better science and better and better communication as we go into the future. But there are really three overlapping issues. There's climate change as an ongoing disaster. There is the risk of seismic events, fires, and other events. And there's the crisis of bay life today, which affordability stresses on its transit systems. So really, that and the deterioration of our environment bring us to what's really important, which is the conversation. So, we're interested in accelerating this conversation. And the policy and research we did really undergirds what we're talking about. Karen will talk to that immediately next. But for us, what's most critical is to start this conversation. And we hope this presentation and the video and today is a conversation starter. I'm going to quickly take you through our site selection process, uh, which began at the regional scale by prioritizing two factors, uh, physical risk and communities at risk, which are populations who have multiple vulnerabilities. And the darkest areas you see here are areas with residents who have seven or more of the factors listed here. For physical vulnerability, we prioritize liquefaction potential from earthquake, uh, storm surge and fl inland flooding and also sea level rise using a nine inch baseline because that's considered most probable by 2040. So we can say uh, with some confidence that this is going to be the norm in just two decades. And that's because of the topography of the bay. Um, it's very shallow, and so the initial 6 to 12 inches of sea level rise will actually cause very extensive and widespread flooding. Uh, and then that area gets shallower and shallower, as you can see. Which is to say that this is not an issue for the future. It's, very, it's happening now. So we combined our physical vulnerability with our community vulnerability, and that gives us this map. Um, our composite minus existing wetlands. So that's what you see here. There are communities of need spread throughout the bay as well as uh, low-lying areas inland. And so from this, we chose the very darkest colors, so communities who have the most need, the most risk factors, um, and those who would experience direct impact from just six inches of sea level rise. Um, and so that's what, oops. That's what this is. This is those communities in need shown with respect to their watersheds because obviously we need to be planning 
by watershed, not by jurisdiction. And we limit it to those watersheds that have open channels or creeks because those are going to experience inland flooding, uh, but they also provide great opportunity for um, habitat, recreation, and also Bay Area access. So that regional scale analysis got us so far, and then we asked a series of questions that would help us hone in on other areas. Um, and through that conversation and digging a bit deeper, uh, we settled on uh, San Pablo Bay and San Rafael. San Rafael has, has urgent need, um, but not a resilience plan, although they just completed a very detailed vulnerability assessment, um, especially the Canal District, which has 80% Latino population. It experienced, um, in the last 25 years, about 50% population increase, but no increase in housing. Uh, so there's a lot of overcrowding. Um, and really importantly, it's only 75% um, of the residents of that district are renters, which means they likely are not aware of their, uh, the risks involved of where they're living because they're not required to tell them that by law. <clears throat> so this would be a, a, a one-year storm in just uh, two decades, which could cause anywhere from one foot to five and a half feet of overland flood. The, much of the housing is uh, multi-unit, and it's Foundations are not built to withstand liquefaction, and so that puts um, a lot of people at risk. Um, as you know, these are former mud flats with really soft soils, so you have vulnerability for people, for infrastructure, um, and for buildings. And these are people who are not, um, don't have the resources to recover easily from such things. Sorry, I should. Um, also concerning is that the evacuation routes, 580 and 101, are also sitting over these soils. Um, and so that uh, puts them prone to a failure during an earthquake, uh, similar conditions that we've seen in previous Bay Area quakes. So we see data, we see urgency. Um, and in parallel to all of this, uh, there's people in making this real. And so there's a parallel track of this of just getting out and talking to people and finding out, are you aware that, there's, that, that this is coming? And in our research, no. Uh, and on many cases, many levels, across ethnicities, no. And that's a huge problem uh, and, and something that we grapple with. Uh, and so it, it, it really characterizes the issue for us. It's a grand challenge. A lot of work's been done. Uh, and that adaptation for something this big will take time. And, and so we're confronted with a very simple question. Uh, how, how can we help? Uh, and where, where do you start? Uh, and so um, our answer was, um, we, we've thought about this in several ways. One way to think about it is just now. Uh, start small and start now and start at this lowest yeah, small, now, low. Small, <laughs> now, low. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to have a good team behind you. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then there are things to be done sooner, uh, and that's still urgent. And then there are much larger ambitious uh, endeavors, and th those will probably come later. Uh, another way to say it is easy, harder, hardest. Uh, and so... Uh, to start, how do you, you know, solve sea level rise? Stickers. So this is the first thing you do. Uh, and the way this works, thank you. You got one of these. It shows a flood line. It's got a little ruler here. And you go and you find some object somewhere. So, so the idea with this is, you know, this is an everywhere issue, right? That that nobody, you know, nobody knows. It's not visible, uh, and so uh, we think this is an idea transferable for everyone, wherever you go. Uh, this is, you're going to have this issue too, and the idea would be to proliferate. Right to 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 make this every day on every object uh, and to make it real and make it persist and 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 raise awareness and keep this in conversation uh, because uh, larger scale efforts and transformation need that support. So uh, 
proliferate. Uh, the next thing we think makes sense for San Rafael is there's there's so fragile in some places that that community keep holding together. Do a cup do a couple of things like protect their community center or their health center or their food resources. And the, these are stopgap uh, measures like flood walls, but uh, it, it, the larger importance is keeping people together. Uh, why? Because the social resilience. Then there's this idea of um, of sorry, this is then preparing. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna flood, uh, it's helpful to have a boat. So uh, uh, so this is an idea about getting uh, boat lockers, stationing them within the compu community, having this visibility and communication, and then one day um, you know those resources are there in an emergency. To use boats, uh, you need to know about water. So right here at Pickleweed Park, uh, there's a great place to do a boating center. Simple, easy, fast idea. Teach people about water and boats so when they need to use them, they know how. Then scaling up from that, uh, there's an existing living shoreline pilot. Many of our team members have participated. It's in San Rafael. The next step for this is to just experiment more, uh, a lot more. Uh, and so the, a, a small step would be develop a kind of section from the mud line to the, to the top of levee, this time include people, uh, and make it something that, um, that builds awareness and, and, and knowledge, and then sc uh, scale that up to the whole shoreline and connect it to the neighborhoods and to, to the way people would use it every day. Uh, then. Uh, the next kind of step up is housing stock. Uh, the housing stock uh, Karen described, there's a lot of it. Uh, it. And the canal really calls for its own uh, typology of new housing stock. So uh, as ownership, uh, car dealerships fade because uh, mobility is changing and big box fails because it does reliably every Christmas, uh, infill and develop this new breed of housing where it's floodable on the first floor and it's meant to adapt over time to to live around water. Uh, and then the next scale up from that is the edge. Uh, the edge in San Rafael is a sharp line and it really needs to be redefined and there are opportunities to do this. The idea would be uh, create more exchange, uh, layer it so that it has uh, more resilience and it's it's uh, it's adapt it's it and its ecologies are adapting over time, and then uh, make a way to, uh, to uh, evolve upland. Uh, and so this is going from a strict line to a zone. Then the next step up from that is the canal itself. The canal is a beautiful, charming place, and nobody knows about it. Uh, and uh, it has a lot to do. It's a divide in its own right. Uh, a waterfront at the canal to solve the issues of low bridges and failing seawalls and uh, several resources that could be connected together uh, would really solve some short-term issues about connectivity and some larger, more profound issues about, about social resilience and, and connection to one another. And if you did that over time, buildings would turn and face the canal and become part of life there as opposed to trying to separate themselves from it. Then. There's upstream of the creek. Um, the creek has a sedimentation issue in San Rafael. It fills up with sediment. Last time they dredged it, two million bucks, and the Corps of Engineers said that's probably the last time that's going to happen. It's, it, needs, it needs more dynamic hydraulics to be more self-regulating. The reason, a big reason, is because it has two right angles before it hits the channel. So putting a curve back in the creek, making that a wider space, puts a you know, the potential for a waterfront in, in downtown San Rafael, closer to transit. And if you talk about this creek, the Crooked Creek, you, you have to talk about the freeway that spans it. There are kind of two San Rafaels. There's one on one side of the freeway and there's one on the other. And, this, and the freeway itself is in a huge seismic risk. And we know that freeways collapse and soft soils collapse in earthquakes. So if you thinking really big about this, that freeway underground opens up an enormous amount of space. Uh, it allows you to adapt to the elevational challenges. It allows you to kind of reposition uh, uh, housing and the industrial jobs uh, that, that move through there. And it allows you to, to reposition the transit. So this, this would be creating connections. Uh, you make a boulevard out of, out of this, uh, out of this uh, big track that cuts through the city now. And in doing this, you, you create a much greater possibility for the smart train, which right now is built below flood elevation. So 
Uh, this would allow you to build the smart train at a higher elevation, connect it to development opportunities which can fund things, and get to uh, the Larkspur terminal. If you got smart to the Larkspur terminal, then the, the much bigger idea you need to be talking about is the bridge itself. Uh, that there, th this is an island uh, when it comes to uh, getting, you know, uh, people getting uh, to, to Marin County. Uh, this erector set is the oldest bridge in, uh, in the, the three bridge tripart that makes the bay really work. And this needs to be conceived of as not a monofunctional piece of infrastructure, but multifunctional. More modes, includes people, includes trains, uh, and is built for the future. And it's in, you have to think about it that way, because if, if you, the, the, this observation that there's kind of four strategic points in the Bay Area that really make everything work, and so much flows through these points, and San Rafael is one of them. So, uh, stickers uh, to the region. Uh, and you know, start small, um, make no small plans. Thank you. Hmm? Okay, uh, before everyone gets too comfortable in their conversations, um, we are going to get started with the, uh, with the last presentation before lunch. Uh, so I just wanted to um, let people know we have uh, over 200 people watching our live stream uh, throughout the region and throughout the world, as far as I know. So, uh, um, so anyway, um, just to let people know, hello people out there. Um, Without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome up the field operations team. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, I'm Richard Kennedy with James Corner Field Operations. On behalf of the field operations team, we are very excited to be at this point and to be sharing our ideas for a more resilient Bay Area. When we began this effort, we had this notion of one bay, many communities, many solutions. The idea that the bay is something that we all share as we live around its edges in various cities and communities around the bay. But the notion of many communities, many solutions suggests that any approach to addressing sea level rise and resiliency around the bay area needs to accommodate an enormous amount of variation, enormous amount of difference, uh, and a variety of points of view. Over the past two months, we've been touring sites around the Bay with many of you, um, visiting over 50 uh, sites uh, around the North, South, East, and West Bays. And one of the things that became very clear to us as we toured around these sites uh, is that many of them are actually disconnected from the Bay itself. 
there are, there are a number of barriers between communities and the waters of the bay, highways, train lines, water infrastructure. Uh, and in some ways, uh, some of the communities actually turn their backs on the marshes of the bay. They see little value in the marshes or little opportunities for connection. So we asked ourselves a number of questions. Uh, the first is how might we reconnect bay communities to the bay in more direct, visceral, and experiential ways? The second, uh, how might we think about a number of communities, not only in terms of sea level rise resiliency, but also in terms of more broader resilient systems? more infrastructures, more mobility, more connectivity, more community, more housing. What if we think of the bay in terms of more nature? So expanding the ecological initiatives around the bay, the, the, salt, ponds, the salt ponds to the South Marsh in the South Bay and, and, and salt ponds at the South Marsh project, the living shorelines on the North Bay, expand these to do more across the Bay Area uh, and to contribute to a more resilient uh, region. Identify also more connectivity uh, opportunities. So finding those projects that can increase capacity for the whole region in the, with the most effective way. So this does mean more trans-bay tubes, more connections across the bay. So big scale efforts like that, but also finer grain networks of hubs, connection points that link smaller communities and more remote communities to each other and to the whole region. Uh, and then lastly, more community. Identifying opportunities for new investment for densification, for uh, intensification, uh, and housing within communities uh, and cities around the Bay. So this idea of more nature, more connectivity, and more community, the kind of ingredients to create a more resilient Bay Area, all with the effort to try to connect communities more integrally uh, to the Bay itself. So we call our effort Bay Towns, reconnecting cities uh, to the Bay and revitalizing the edge. Uh, so our approach is about nature, but it's also about how uh, communities and towns around the Bay relate to one another uh, and to the Bay itself. And we do this through four physical typologies, what we call edges, sponges, corridors, and hubs. And they all have a particular function, uh, and they would all be differentiated by place. Edges are about protection, addressing sea level rise at the perimeter. Sponges are about absorption, uh, retention, detention, and collection of stormwater within the communities and urban districts. Corridors are about investment, about creating new opportunities for growth, for housing and densification, uh, but also community amenities and community benefits. And hubs are about transit and connectivity, nodes within communities that link them to each other and to the whole region. So each of these moves, edges, sponges, corridors, and hubs, are differentiated and varied depending on where they are and where they're located, particular locales and settings. In choosing where to apply this idea and this methodology, uh, we decided to made an early decision to just spread ourselves around the bay, to pick a site in the north, a site in the south, a site in the east, and a site in the west. We chose the sites then based on those that are the most lowest lying and most vulnerable today. So the communities that are the most susceptible to sea level rise uh, in the near future. We started with San Rafael in the north. San Rafael is today a cool and charming place. Uh, it actually has a great marina feel. Uh, it's a charming uh, community centered around the canal district in the San Rafael Creek. Uh, there are a number of attractions on the canal itself. Uh, so water activities, water access sites, restaurants and cafes. This is an events ground on the canal. It's, it's a fantastic place. I suggest you go there. I've taken my family there. It's really, really great. It's also connected to the Smart Hub. Uh, this is a hub and node uh, for North Bay communities that connects trains to shuttles and buses for the whole region. San Rafael is also a very organized community. They dub themselves the city with a mission, and we, we believe that's true. This is a community that is ready to make things happen. But there are many issues and challenges. 580 and, eight, and 101 come together and separate neighborhoods from each other and neighborhoods from the Bay. Some of the roads and bridges are very low-lying. They're very close to sea level today and are already susceptible to flooding and inundation. The same is true for housing. There's housing perched on the canal district, very low-lying uh, and experiencing flooding today. And the canal itself uh, is, is, uh, uh, needs to be dredged. This is very costly uh, and there's no long-term source of funding. So those ideas seen more geographically and spatially. You have the San Rafael Central Reach here. In 2050, most of that entire uh, reach, uh, downtown and the canal district is flooded, and that issue is only exacerbated over time. It is all on mud, this whole central reach and downtown area, uh, and critical transit infrastructure of the region is passing through. So lots of vulnerabilities and issues to, to address. We begin and we start with the edge, and we look at the edge and try to find ways to revitalize this edge uh, as a more robust living uh, natural system 
trying to restore some of the historic marshes uh, that once occupied this watershed. And so we do that by identifying the lowest lying and most um, underutilized sites along the eastern shoreline today. So Canalway site and other, and other underutilized sites. Those become areas that the uh, future bay will be able to be let in and migrate inward. So setting up sites for as, that are open space and parks today that become the future marshlands uh, and edge habitats. We also expand the Living Shorelines projects and all the experiments there, not only to build up subtitle habitat, but also to trap sediment that's moving in the region and help to build up mud for even more protection over the long term. So a much thicker and more ecologically robust edge. Inland, within the canal district, uh, we propose a mosaic of sponges. These are stormwater absorption gardens on the one hand, so uh, projects to collect water, re uh, retain water, detain water, uh, but also uh, they become the green infrastructure for any future community uh, in the central district. Um, the parks, the green spaces, the sport fields that are serving dual function of collecting water, reducing impacts of flooding, but are also the community amenities uh, for, for the people of San Rafael. We leverage the Smart Hub and make it connect to more people uh, and offer more for North Bay, tying the North Bay to the whole region. And then lastly, we revitalize the Canal District. Uh, and we do this by opening up sites along the Canal District and making a decision to make the Canal District a central and mixed-use hub uh, of San Rafael. We take material from the Canal, we create higher ground for more safe and resilient uh, forms of, of housing and development. Existing housing would remain, but also be lifted up and adapted Alternatively, in those underutilized sites, we also can create green spaces uh, around the mixed uses. So parks today uh, that are uh, recreational amenities for the community, in the long term, they become areas of absorptive grounds for the tides and waters to migrate into. The result is a much greener, uh, more ecologically vital, uh, and more revitalized whole region of San Rafael, uh, all oriented and centered around uh, the, its greatest resource, the canal district and the bay. In the south, we look at an, a, a larger stretch of the South Bay, and we made a decision to look at the stretch from East Palo Alto to Sunnyvale, because for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, the South Bay, in some ways, does have a lot of similarities. There are communities that are all in the Santa Clara Valley are very flat, um, and while they're on the bay, they're psychically disconnected, we would say, from the bay. You can be very close to the bay's shore, but because of the salt ponds and the tidal marshes, the bay waters are quite far away, so you can be miles away from the water surface. So there's a psychic disconnection uh, to some communities. On the other hand, you have communities like East Palo Alto that are right there, they're right on the frontier. These are the first, this is one of the first communities that will be susceptible to flooding uh, with sea level rise, and so it's, it's an immediate and urgent condition. So we look at that stretch from East Palo Alto all the way through Sunnyvale, uh, and look at its impacts to, to flooding, 2050 and 2100, exacerbated over time. One of the interesting challenges uh, in working in the South Bay at a large scale is that many municipalities uh, do have uh, jurisdiction over the edge uh, and over the marshes. The salt ponds themselves also have an interesting uh, ownership structure. You have the, the fish and wildlife owning the salt ponds restoration work, but there are a number of other ponds that are outside of that that are owned by local municipalities, local water districts, uh, they're flood basins today or part of the water treatment facility, uh, or they're just part of the overall operation of the uh, connected ponds. So we're trying to find something that's holistic that can address a lot of the similarities here, uh, but try to resolve uh, as many uh, uh, challenges as possible. Beginning with the edge. Uh, we start with the existing levee, uh, shown here today. So this is the current highest point along the edge. And we modify that. We find ways of, of opening that up, widening it at the intersections with the creeks to create what we call micro deltas, intersections where the creeks meet the bay, create more fluvial and inter intertidal conditions. The creeks themselves are also widened out um, and softened. This is a concept that's already in place by the San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority. They are developing innovative ideas about widening, softening the creek uh, within Palo Alto. We take that model and multiply it through the creeks around South Bay, soften the shores and edges, uh, create to slow down water, create opportunities for detention, retention, and ecology. But these also become the trails and parks that connect the towns of South Bay to the bay itself. We then identify the ponds that are not a part of the salt ponds restoration effort, and we begin to adapt those uh, in the near future. So today, they're open water surfaces. Uh, in the near future, these could become part of the Bay Trail and Water Trails program. They could become, they could offer more 
uh, uh, excitement, more uses for more people. So swimming, uh, kayaking, boating, and even surfing happening in these ponds. In the long term, those inland ponds become the, the areas that the tidal marshes migrate into. So as waters rise, those are built up in higher elevation and providing that uh, future protection. And then lastly, we identify sites along the transit corridors of 101 uh, and, and, the, and the rail lines, and those become areas for more housing to help solve uh, issues around growth uh, and capacity uh, in the South Bay. So the result is a much more connected uh, and unified uh, series of communities in South Bay that are all more integrally connected to the water and experience of the Bay. On the east, uh, Oakland and Alameda. Oakland and Alameda are the urban core of the East Bay. Uh, and what's amazing is that there's over 170 communities in the two cities today. Uh, and they're all disconnected from one another by infrastructure. 980, 880, 580, 24, Amtrak, all separate communities from each other, communities from the Bay. So any, any um, uh, effort to address resiliency in the East Bay needs to look at the role that infrastructure plays uh, in terms of what it offers, um, but also um, the liabilities that it creates in terms of health and access uh, to resources and amenities. The diversity of communities is also something to leverage, that while we're thinking and working at a very big scale, uh, we're going to try to uh, increase and maintain that richness and diversity. The waterfront is a project that um, uh, it, it's so obvious that it should be a destination for more people uh, within, within the East Bay. It has one of the most fantastic skylines in the, in the world, looking at San Francisco and the Golden Gate, and that could be leveraged. But there are a number of challenges. Uh, 880 is in the way, and it's a, a major psychic divide between downtown and the waterfront. The same is true for 980. 980 is a big cleft between West Oakland and downtown. The seawall is also old uh, and not sizably stable. It needs to be retrofit to protect future investments uh, and communities living uh, inland of the seawall. So seen geographically, you have Oakland Alameda today. Uh, over time, the west end of, Oak, of Alameda and West Oakland are extremely susceptible to flooding. Uh, and you have critical highway infrastructure coming through the region. So our approach uh, is to look at creating greater connectivity between the two cities. And we start with uh, perhaps our, our most significant move, and this is to propose a new Transbay tube. Uh, this is a center point of our proposal, but it's also a center point of the state rail plan uh, for this year, connecting two of the most uh, critical urban centers of the region to one another. And we do this through the 980 corridor. We take what is a very inefficient corridor today, the sunken bowl shown here. We cap over that. We reorganize laneways uh, and add the train lines within the corridor. We cap over that to create new parklands and green spaces that connect West Oakland to downtown and also open up opportunities for air rights development uh, in the forms of new housing and new amenities. Seen today, that cleft, that divide of 980, a major psychic divide between West Oakland and downtown, capped over to create new, uh, healthier, greener spaces, greener amenities, but also the opportunity for more housing that over time is a way for Oakland uh, and Alameda to grow. We do the same thing with 880 and Amtrak. We take those infrastructures and we, and we sink them down. We take 880, put it below grade and tunnels, creating uh, continuous at-grade boulevards. This seems radical uh, and it seems a, a, like a big move, but we're doing the exact same thing in Seattle's waterfront today, taking down the viaduct along the waterfront and making a strong connection between downtown Seattle and the sound. We do the same thing with Amtrak. We take that, that, that barrier and drop it down, creating continuous at-grade uh, boulevards. So what is now today an unsafe, inaccessible, uh, and disconnected waterfront is made much more accessible, much more linked, uh, much more green, uh, and much more uh, open to more people. Lastly, we look at the edge and develop a seismically, seismically resistant seawall that does more. Uh, it can be ecologically rich, it can, it can incorporate habitat uh, and marshlands, but it can also become more pedestrianized uh, and offering more experiences of the bayfront. The result is more connected, uh, Oakland and Alameda, they're connected to each other and they're connected to the whole region, but they're also greener uh, and more healthy uh, and more vibrant uh, and more accessible uh, throughout. Lastly, on the west, San Francisco Mission Creek. Mission Creek is one of the lowest lying areas of San Francisco. Uh, it, it is a historic creek, uh, and again, one of the lowest lying areas of the city. 
Uh, a lot of investment has happened there in the past uh, decade or more, um, but there's still more to be done. It is not yet complete and is not yet protected from sea level rise. This is an image of the existing houseboat community on Mission Creek. We show this for two reasons. Um, one, um, uh, the idea is that um, uh, we're showing big scale moves here, and any scale, any, any work that would happen in the future would have to involve stakeholders and community members like the houseboat community on Mission Creek, um, and to make sure that it's more rich and thoughtful and nuanced to their particular issues and needs. But also I show this image because it suggests a character and a richness that any future project uh, at Mission Creek might leverage to build in something that is really specific and nuanced to the place. It's quite an eccentric and idiosyncratic thing to really leverage. At this, and, and similarly, the recreational uses of the creek are something to, to leverage as well. The idea of having a linear recreational water body at the center of San Francisco is something to maximize and leverage and make available to more people. But there are issues. 280 and Caltrain separate Mission Bay and Mission Creek from the rest of the eastern uh, uh, neighborhoods and from Soma. There's also a CSO that d dumps into the creek. And there are more innovative ways of dealing with wastewater in cities. And perhaps this could become a pilot or case study to address that. There are shelves of habitat within Mission Creek. But these are vulnerable uh, and susceptible to flooding uh, and inundation. So our, our effort is to address sea level rise first uh, and find quick ways of doing that but to also protect, project, protect infrastructure and create opportunities for more access to the waterfront for more people. The first move is to bring the tube across from the East Bay, connect uh, the tra train line into Mission Creek, into the Caltrain station, and then northward to the Trans Bay Transit Center, connecting San Francisco to the East Bay, increasing the capacity of the rail system of the region significantly. That creates an opportunity to adapt the edges of Mission Creek to create higher ground using that material, lift up the edges, create more ecologically rich infrastructure along the creek, but also higher grounds of amenities and park spaces that the whole region uh, can enjoy. So higher performing edges, greener, richer, more ecologically vital, uh, but also uh, increasing the character of, of Mission Creek that exists today, uh, leveraging this diverse idea of living on the water. And lastly, we identify those areas for investment. Uh, where um, we're opening up opportunities for development and for new housing. S uh, for example, looking at the 280 corridor as well as the Caltrain corridor and just finding ways to open them up uh, and create more air rights opportunities, development opportunities to accommodate future growth of the city. For example, taking the Caltrain corridor here, the King Street Station, uh, and modifying that by compressing it, making it more efficient, capping over it to create new parklands that connect Soma to Mission Creek and the eastern neighborhoods to the waterfront, but also opening up air rights in the form of new housing. Uh, the result is a much more connected, uh, green, uh, and ecologically rich district of the city. Uh, but most importantly, uh, it's about uh, connecting San Francisco to the East Bay, connecting the two major urban cores through a piece of critical infrastructure that will benefit the whole region. So connecting towns together uh, and connecting them all more uh, vividly, more directly, and more experientially to the Bay. Thank you. Thanks so much to our presenters uh, this morning. Thanks to everyone for keeping on time. Uh, so we're going to break for lunch now. We're going to have some time for uh, eating and mingling, and then we're going to get together um, in about a half hour or so. We're going to, um, we've been joined by Hank Ovink, um, our juror and uh, important person in Rebuild by Design and lots of other things as well. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, we'll hear from Hank a little bit uh, to open up our afternoon session. Thank you.